everyone to Off the Cuff, and this is our Road to the Final Four episode. I am Adam Banks, and we are now down to only four teams in the 2015 NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament. And what a week it has been. We last left you with 16 teams remaining in our last podcast, and that's the first thing that we're going to talk about. Chad Rainwater is in the studio with me. Chad, how's it going? Good, man. Thanks for having me once again. It's a pleasure to be on the show. It's uh, awesome to have you, man. And the, like I was telling everybody, the last time we left them, we had 16 teams in the tournament. And the Sweet 16, let's, uh, let's, get, uh, let's talk about that. WVU versus Kentucky is the first game that I want to discuss. But before I really get into detail about the whole WVU and Kentucky thing, there's this individual that I want to talk about really quick. His name is Clay Travis. Clay Travis is a sports writer, a blogger, a radio personality. I don't know. Don't know much about him and hadn't heard much about him until the other day because he tweeted out this tweet, and the tweet went something like this. Kentucky versus West Virginia, that's going to be the dumbest Sweet 16 of all time. In other words, he was calling WVU and UK people idiots. So people from West Virginia and people from Kentucky idiots. So he went on the Paul Feinbaum show and actually went into more detail about what he was talking about. And he uh, never flaked at all. He stood by what he said. He said that people from Kentucky was just ignorant. Well, it really infuriated the Big Blue Nation because Paul and Feinbaum on his show, for that next 30 minutes that Clay Travis was on his show, he only took callers from Kentucky. He And uh, let me just say that it didn't work out in Clay Travis's uh, case, but um, I don't even like talking about him because all it does is give him publicity and it gives him more Twitter followers, but... He is the biggest prick in sports to talk yeah. about Kentucky like that. Yeah, I don't know much about him either, but I heard him about him um, a few months ago. He wrote, a, he wrote his first the article about the, I think it was top ten dumbest fan bases. I don't think Kentucky was number. They might have been number one. Probably. I, mean, probably I, thought, I thought it was. It might have been Alabama. Kentucky was up there, like number two or something. It's stupid, but you just can't listen to what he says. He's an idiot. He's obviously a hater of Kentucky. And it sounds like he's a hater of West Virginia as well. But this he just he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's dumb. Just don't listen to what he says. Yeah, so he's just trying to get some Twitter followers. Yeah, right. So <laughs> screw you, uh, Clay Travis. I just wanted to bring that up really quick. But WVU in Kentucky, an absolute blowout, Chad. They they absolutely killed him. It was the most boring game of the Sweet Sixteen. Yeah, that's pretty funny that uh, doing the research for this. Uh, Podcast. What was the first thing we had on our uh, notes here? Was uh, I had blowout central, and you had some about the same thing. I had it was a blowout. I had an absolute blowout. I mean, that sums up in one word. We were just too too good for and too big for West Virginia. Um, they tried to press, and we just broke the press, and just I think as we had like a two to nothing lead, it, it, we just never looked back. So Cal is now three and eight against Huggins, and uh, two three quality wins, I guess, against Huggins because. Uh, anytime you beat a coach in the tournament, it always is better than beating them in the regular season because you keep them from cutting down that net at the end of the at the end of the I, tournament. I agree. Yes. So uh, when Kentucky when Kentucky shoots the ball well, they're virtually impossible to beat, and that's exactly what they did. They shot the ball uh, tremendously well. Uh, West Virginia's freshman Daxter Miles he proclaimed on the Wednesday before the game. That Kentucky was going to be thirty six and one, and he made a big scuffle over that. Do you remember that? I do. I kind of you kind of feel bad for the guy, no matter who it is. Like he, you know, they wanted that game so bad, and to come out and lose seventy eight to thirty nine, that's that's just really embarrassing. Uh, like I said, I feel bad for the kid. Um, he at one point he had, like he didn't have any points at all in like late in the first half, so he didn't bring his A game. Uh, obviously, neither did uh, the rest of the team. Uh, you but know, it's just. You, you, but if you're gonna you're gonna say things like that, you got to come out and show it. Miles finished the night with no points oh, and one okay. rebound, okay. and afterward, the, uh, the cats made it evident that they had been aware of this proclamation that he made. Because after the game was over and Kentucky won, uh, not only was uh, Daxter Miles totally humiliated for what he said, and he played such a terrible game. I mean, he couldn't have played it. He couldn't have worked out better for Kentucky's scenario, but he played such an awful game, scoring no points, and he was humiliated. He kept his head down the whole time, and the Cats made it pretty evident that they were uh, they kept their mouth shut a lot before the game, but after the game, 
They were very subtle with their tweets on Twitter. Devin Booker tweeted out 36 and 1 and spelled W-O-N. W-O-N. I saw that. And then Aaron Harrison tweeted out, or it was Andrew Harrison, one of the Harrison twins, uh, tweeted out similar, kind of the same thing, and was just like, yeah, um, he kind of tweeted out kind of like a similar message to uh, Daxter Miles. But I guess lesson learned is don't talk crap about the number one team in the nation that's undefeated. Right, right. <laughs> I, don't even know. I mean, but really, the, the, the highlight of that game was probably the referee falling. Oh, my gosh. I, we didn't even talk about that since then. That was so funny. Like, when the uh, – uh, who was it? That, we got a uh, uh, Devin Booker got called for that foul. And right. then – the guys, or he tripped over the guy that was about to check in. That was so funny. We, me, I watched that at Jordan's house, and we replayed that. And it was so hilarious. It, it was, it was, it was probably. I really feel like it was the. Uh, <laughs> it had to be embarrassing. It was, it, was the, it was the highlight of the game. If not that, it was probably Huggins' face the whole time. Like he was making these, just he was blowing and he was just rubbing his hair. And his uh, attire that he came out in. Yeah. Yes. Speaking of that, Huggins. He looks like a middle school gym teacher. Well, I thought it looked like a chef's outfit. Like, he's about to go <laughs> cook some food on the Food Network. That's what, I, that's what my, that my first thought was. Right. Like, why don't he wear a suit? That really irritates me that he don't wear a suit. I feel like college coaches should wear suits. That's he's always been like that, where he dresses casual. He never he never dresses up with like a tie. Yeah, I guess he feels like it's more sh- fan spirit because he wears the warm-up uniform of WVU. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but... You know what I didn't mention, though, that could have been the highlight of the game was that Andrew Harrison circus dunk that he made when he was – he basically just threw the ball up just over his back, tripping out of bounds, and it went in. Please tell me you remember that. I don't dunk. remember that. It, it was when was circus. that? It was, it was the dunk. And Devin Booker was trailing behind him just in case that he missed the, the shot. And Devin even jumped up to get the rebound, but that shot went in and – Harrison just had the biggest smile on his face. I'm going to have to show you. Okay, I'll have to see that. I don't really remember it off the top of my head. But it it was a great game, WVU and Kentucky. Another key game in the Sweet 16 was Wisconsin versus the University of North Carolina. Wisconsin trailed at halftime and faced a four-point deficit with less than seven minutes to play. And Sam Decker, who uh, poured in a career-high 23 points to go along with 10 rebounds. Fellow star... Frank Kaminsky and Nigel Hayes also scored in double figures, combining for 31 points and 14 boards. So the veteran Badgers uh, found a way to keep dancing with a 79-72 victory over the Tar Heels. What did you think of that game? I was actually going for North Carolina in this game. Uh, They were up most of the first half and a good portion of the second, and they just couldn't hit free throws down the stretch. Uh, Missed a lot of key free throws. Um, The Badgers were too much for them. Like I said, uh, I had it in my bracket that I'll – or on the last po- podcast that we had, I said that I thought North Carolina could beat them, and right. they they were close, but just they they weren't enough for the veteran uh, Wisconsin Badgers. North Carolina was playing well, and uh, it, it was a, you know I, I'm not gonna you know lose any sleep over North Carolina losing. I'm I'm never a fan of seeing North Carolina win, but yeah, they they did play they did play well. I think Roy Williams was just happy to get to a, a Sweet Sixteen because it, he's not been there in a while. Um, I think the last Elite Eight, the last time he was even close to the Final Four, it was in Elite Eight, and it was in 2011. And that's when Kentucky beat Roy Williams, I believe. That's right, yeah. In 2011, we beat them. Yeah, I remember that game. So, yeah, so Roy Williams had to lace his boots and, and go home. But another game was the Wichita uh, State versus Notre Dame. And uh, Greg Marshall, the coach of Wichita, he, uh, Wichita was actually a four-point favorite in that game. Did you know that? I did not know that. I, that's that's really surprising. Yeah, so um, Wichita def- got defeated by Notre Dame, and Notre Dame, we'll get to them in a minute. But that was a very interesting game. So, but yeah, pretty much uh, that was the Sweet 16. The um, Of course, the, the guys who, um, well, the Michigan State game, uh, I want to bring that up, they defeated Oklahoma. And what was the final score on that? Do you know right off the top of your head? They they defeated Oklahoma and Michigan State's just been playing absolutely insane basketball. Tom Izzo has cut, took them to the Elite Eight and to face uh, Louisville. And the final of that game was uh, sixty-two to fifty-eight. Right. So basically, the Elite Eight ended up with being Kentucky, Notre Dame, Wisconsin, Arizona, 
uh, Louisville, Michigan State, Duke, and Gonzaga. So uh, that is our Elite Eight. But, you know, what I want to do now is I want to hear from a Kentucky fan. and Because uh, I want to talk about the Elite Eight game. And the Elite Eight game, the first game that I want to talk about is Kentucky versus Notre Dame. So what we're going to do, we're going to get him on the phone. And I want to ask him just what he thought of the Notre Dame game and what he thought of uh, the game, of what he thinks about Kentucky going to the Final Four. But before we talk about the Kentucky game, let's... Let's talk about really the uh, another key Elite Eight game: Wisconsin versus Arizona. Chad, what did you think of that game? Wisconsin and Arizona in the Elite Eight. That was a pretty good game. Uh, I didn't realize that Wisconsin put put up 55 points in the second half. That's pretty impressive. Uh, I didn't catch much of the first half. Spent most of my time uh, looking for a freaking parking spot, trying to get the two keys. Uh, <laughs> so I, I I got there with uh, maybe midway through the first. First quarter. I'm trying to find the uh, score here of that well, game. Well, Frank, Frank Kaminsky uh, became Wisconsin's all-time tournament scorer um, in that tournament, and uh, he scored 29 points. And uh, Wisconsin uh, defeats Arizona and becomes the uh, – this is their fourth Final Four appearance in school history. So Wisconsin pulled it off. Yeah, Sam Ducker had another good game. Uh, he actually had a – his previous his previous uh, career high was twenty three, set in fr- on Friday's victory over North Carolina, and he came out and scored twenty seven against Arizona, um, shooting eight for ten, including five of six from three point land. They the Badgers are scary when it comes to three point shooting. They shot twelve threes in the second half, hit ten of them, and went uh, a total of twelve of eighteen from three point land. That's that's pretty impressive. It is especially enough. against uh, Arizona defense. Yeah, I know. And, you know, Sean Miller, it was a rematch from last year. Arizona played Wisconsin in the Elite Eight. And Sean Miller, he's going to get to a Final Four eventually. And I think someday he's going to win a national championship. Some people say that Sean Miller could be a possible candidate if John Calipari ever left Kentucky. And I could see that because he he plays fast-paced basketball, and that's what Kentucky likes. And, I, I you know, he always has his team. He gets his team to the tournament every year. And he usually places them in a, in a good, decent spot. So, you know. Another game that I want to talk about is the Kentucky versus Notre Dame. And, uh, Chad, were we able to get Harrison Sims on the phone? Um, uh, hopefully we did. Uh, okay, so I wanted, the reason I wanted to bring this guy on the show, he is a huge U.K. fan, and I wanted our listeners to get a perspective of what it was like to hear from a U.K. fan. Um, Harrison, are you there? Yes, I am. How, how's it going, buddy? Thanks for doing the show. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. It's going pretty good. Hey, man, no problem at all. Uh, Kentucky versus Notre Dame in the uh, Elite Eight. What a game that was. But, you know, Harrison, i got to ask you, do you have any game day rituals that you like to do before uh, a U.K. game starts? I know that um, a lot of people like to wear the same shirt or maybe wear the same hat. I've even heard Coach Cal, he likes to eat a bowl of Wendy's chili before every game in Rupp Arena. <laughs> so is there anything uh, that you do before a U.K. game? Uh, my main thing is I usually wear the same shirt, but I'm the same boat with a lot of people. Well, Whatever you're doing, keep doing it because we're in the Final Four. Oh, yeah. It's on now. Okay, so uh, the, let's talk about the game. Kentucky, Notre Dame. Did you think uh-huh. for a second that Kentucky was beat or did you remain confident the entire time? There was one point where I was really worried. It was Aaron had just hit the three to take the lead and Grant came back down, knocked the three down. We took the lead, and all I could think was back in, uh, I guess it was 2005, I believe, 2005 or 2003 when Dwayne Wade was that one player that just wasn't going to let his team lose. So when Grant came down and hit that three, I was like, I was, that's when I was worried. Right. You know, when Tyler Eulis, I think he kind of, it was a, almost a game, when I was closing my eyes the whole time. I, I really, when I get nervous, I can't watch. I, I wish I had a radio in my ear to, to listen to the game because I can't watch when games are close. But when Tyler Eulis hit that three, I felt like that there was just such a relief and just such a weight off my shoulders when he hit that. And it yeah. scared the absolute. When he hit, when he hit that three, I was, 
Paul Jones in my mind before he hit the third winner down by six. I just thought back to the LSU and the Georgia games, and I was like, they pulled it off then. There's still five, six minutes left in this game. So I wasn't nervous yet, but when it got down to about ten minutes and Grant hit that three, that's when it definitely hit me. You, you know, Harrison, and the TV ratings were insane for that game. Did you know yep. that the Kentucky versus Notre Dame game was the highest-rated college basketball game in cable network history? Yep, I actually saw that. But that's, in today's age, when you got a team that's undefeated, going for perfection, everybody wants to watch it. I completely agree with you. And, you know uh, – you know, it's people like you and people like Chad and I that make Kentucky what it is. It's the Big Blue Nation. We, it's, yeah. it's crazy how powerful the Big Blue Nation is. We, we tweet something out, and it's automatically the number one thing to, uh, <laughs> trending on Twitter. Yeah. Like Big Blue Nation all week has been trending on Twitter, and it's, it's quite amazing. So Kentucky, they did defeat Notre Dame by the hair of their skin, and they advanced to the Final Four. And it looks like that we're going to have a rematch with Wisconsin. How do you think this team matches up against uh, this year's Wisconsin team? Because they got pretty much all their players back. What does Kentucky got to do to make sure that they beat Wisconsin like they did last year? I think the key to this, I mean, you got to, they got, for, for me, it's they got two main guys, Kaminsky and Decker. Decker went for 15 last year against us, and I think Kaminsky went, he actually on a free stop for eight points. So, I think, Gotta stop those two first of all, and then I think Kentucky's big tried to dominate the paint last year. They scored. They last year they definitely dominated the paint big time. It was it wasn't even close. And but uh, I think Towns and Willie and uh, Trey, they're definitely gonna have to have, come and have a big game. That's for sure. You know, I, I agree with you, and uh, it's it's crazy that we're meeting up with Wisconsin again, second year in a row. Um, I, got, I actually bought a shirt last year uh, before the Wisconsin Kentucky game. It's a beat Wisconsin shirt, and I was like, you know, this is silly. I'm spending money on this because what, when am I ever going to be able to wear this shirt again? And here we are in 2015. We're playing them again. Yep, I pulled mine out of the drawer today. Got it ready. Going to iron it up and wear it on Saturday. <laughs> you bought the same shirt. Bought the same shirt, and I'm glad I'm going to wear it again. Yeah. So, um, you know. Harrison and I was actually – I actually met Harrison at the game uh, last weekend uh, at the uh, Elite Eight game. And um, the atmosphere at Two Keys downtown Lexington was absolutely unbelievable. Harrison, have you been watching the games downtown or was that your first time out uh, this tournament watching the games? Uh, I watched – let's see. I watched the – I watched the West Virginia game at Two Keys Saturday. And then uh, – and then that was the second time that was Saturday. Yeah. You know, if if somebody was to ask you, if you wanted to explain to our listeners, because I'm sure the listeners are curious about what it's what the atmosphere is like watching the game downtown Lexington during the uh, March Madness, because we're so passionate. How would you describe Big Blue Nation? How would you describe that atmosphere like like it was at Two Keys? It's wild. What a game! Everybody's just happy, ready for the game to start. Start. You can hear. It. I mean, it gets it gets quiet in there, and then all of a sudden, it does well. It gets loud. Uh, then, of course, it's a close game. You can you can literally feel the tension in the room. I agree. We win, like we did Saturday. The place just goes nuts. It's, it's wild to be there. You have to. It's one of those things you have to experience. Absolutely. You know, going off what you said, Harrison. Uh, this is Chad, by the way. Yeah. Um. Then. In that game, when uh, there was a couple of times where we just didn't think we were going to pull it out, you know, I, I, I had faith in Cal. I've always had faith in Cal ever since he's come, he's come here. And But this game where Notre Dame would just come right back at us, some people in the crowd were just – I mean, there was fans beside us in tears with four minutes to go. And I'm not going to say any names, but I was like, come on now. There's, this is Cal's team. Like, we have this game. Like, so just – the heart that these fans have for the for Big Blue Na- or for the Cats is is unbelievable. Like with two minutes to go, four minutes to go, and we're down by two points. And this, I, I don't mean I just wanted to bring that up because some of the people, it's the negative, some of the negativity that's going around is just crazy. And like I can't even believe they're acting like that. Like I knew we had this game. You know, and you know, fans are just so passionate. They're they're gonna they're gonna get teared up. 
they're gonna they're gonna scream, they're gonna get mad, and you know, kind of what go, uh, Harrison was saying, they get you can feel the tension when Kentucky is uh, just down, and that was one time Harrison I really thought that it might be over, and, and you know, the scenario that people that. You know, this was before Louisville lost. And people were saying, oh, Banks, here's two scenarios for you. Imagine if UK lost in the Elite Eight and Louisville went to the Final Four. Or imagine if UK makes it to the championship game and plays Louisville and Louisville beats them. And I just couldn't live with that because I hate the Louisville Cardinals and thank God they lost. What's your What's your take on Louisville? I do not like them at all. <laughs> I, honestly, I... I'll be honest with you though. I wanted, I wanted them to make the championship, and I play them because I did not. There was no way. I, in my mind, they were not going to beat us this year. It's just not going to happen. So I wanted to have that go forty and zero, win the championship. They, I mean, they wouldn't be able to live that down if we would have done that. So, but once I was actually, I, I wanted them to make it, but for reasons that down the road they were going to be hearing that from Kentucky fans for a long time. Yeah, and uh, and Louisville fans is what makes me uh, well, and besides Rick Pitino, is what makes me despise that program. But uh, I expect to see you in your in the same shirt if we run into each other again uh, during the Final Four or the championship game, Harrison. Okay. Oh yeah. And I want to appreciate you coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me. No problem. Go Cats. All right. Go Cats. And that was Harrison Sims, uh, UK. He's part of Big Blue Nation, a big fan here in Kentucky. And I wanted everybody to kind of get, uh, just hear what a fan had to say about UK. But, so yeah, Kentucky versus Notre Dame was a great game. And we talked about Wisconsin and Arizona. Let's talk about Louisville, Michigan State, since we're on the subject of Louisville, about how I cannot stand them. Michigan State defeats Louisville. And I, I seriously, I went out to watch that game, Chad, just to watch Louisville lose. Did you get a chance to watch it? Yeah, I caught a little bit of the second half. Uh, that actually had to start at the end of the first half. And Louisville had a – was it an eight-point eight point lead going into halftime? I think it was, they were about eight and right. a half. Yes. Um, yeah, but like we talked about before, I had a, kind of had a feeling that Michigan State was going to pull this off just because what they bring, what Tom Izzo brings to this team and to, when he plays in the tournament, NCAA tournament, uh, Louisville missed a couple of free throws on the stretch, just like North Carolina did in the Sweet 16. Um this this veteran team of Michigan State, uh, Travis Trice is playing unbelievable right now. He he kind of reminds me of the Kimba Walker, a Kimba Walker and uh, Shabazz Napier yeah. U, uh, from UConn a couple years ago. He's just he's come to play and he just and they're just that team right now that are on a hot streak. And I wouldn't be surprised if they uh, they're gonna they're gonna be a tough matchup for Duke. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you see uh, Michigan State actually pulling the upset and go to the championship game, just because how many uh, how hot they are right now and this, their players on their team. They just want it so bad, and I would actually I'd like to see them in the championship game with us. And they're playing so well. And this was Louisville's. This was really Louisville's last chance to make a run in a tournament for a while because next year they're going to stink. Oh yeah, they're, they're, they they don't have any recruits coming in. They're Nothing worth mentioning, and they're, you know, this was kind of their last kind of hoorah to maybe make it to a Final Four. Now, I could be eating my words next year, which I doubt I will be, but uh, Louisville is out, and I couldn't be happier. Yeah, well, they, uh, this season, I don't think it wasn't a, gr- it wasn't a great season for them, but, I mean, they they uh, overachieved. They weren't supposed to do that much. I mean, they... Dropped a couple of games earlier in the season. They lost their uh, starting point guard. You know, they thought things were going to go down the hill for them. But they, they continued to fight. And, I mean, like we said earlier, the, I guess the regular season really doesn't matter. But they've shown that they were trying to battle as well in the tournament. Duke versus Gonzaga was uh, the uh, last game here that we'll talk about. That, But, anyway, Michigan State advances to the Final Four. Uh, Duke versus Gonzaga. Um, Duke held zero, or I'm sorry, yes, Duke held zero field goals and only two points in the final six minutes to qualify for their 16th Final Four in school history. Think about that for a second. 16 Final Fours in school history. And that is all done by Coach K. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive right there. What would that school be without Coach K? Probably nothing. 
Probably nothing. It's all about the coach. It is. And Coach K is one of the greatest coaches of all time. And to have him at, at a school like Duke, that just it's just amazing how well he's done with that that program and how he's been there for so long. And like you said, 16 Final Fours is just it's unbelievable. It's quite remarkable. Matt Jones was the player of the game. He scored six of ten field goals. And that also included four three pointers, and he scored and he finished with sixteen points. So uh, Duke makes it back to the Final Four since the first time in two thousand and ten, where they actually won the championship. And here's a crazy stat about Duke. And it's not really a good stat if you're a Kentucky fan. If you're if you're a Kentucky fan, or if you're a Michigan State fan. Or if you are a Wisconsin fan, right? This thanks for adding that. Yes, <laughs> this is not good because. Go ahead and say the stat. All right. So Duke's returning to Indianapolis for the Final Four, and other four national championship victories. Two of them have come at Indianapolis in 1991 and in their last championship game in 2010. So, Indy is uh, is. Familiar with Duke going up in there and uh, cutting down the nets. Makes me nervous. Coach K reaches 12 Final Four. He he reaches his 12th Final Four, and there's 16 Final Fours in school history. So how does that add up? Was there a coach before Coach K to reach the Final Four with Duke? It had to have been, I guess. I, I seriously had no idea that Duke was that type of school before Coach K came, so maybe I'll have to check in on that. But he actually ties with John Wooden. So, John Wooden, the coach of former coach of UCLA, and Coach K actually tie with twelve Final Fours in the NCAA tournament. Uh, Wilcher in that game for Gonzaga, he was the player of the game for Gonzaga. He had sixteen points and only scored one in the final eighteen minutes. So that was huge. I think Wilcher was their best player, and Kyle Wilcher, a former player at UK, won a national championship at UK. Um, I, I, I'm not surprised that Gonzaga lost to Duke. Duke is a better team, and not only is Duke a better team, but Gonzaga really doesn't play anybody. Gonzaga is in the West Coast Conference. Who's in that conference other than Gonzaga? Do you Washington's know? Uh, Mount Saint or Saint Mary's? But yeah, they don't play anybody. I don't even think their non-conference schedule was that great. And the teams that they did play that were actually decent, I believe they've lost to them. I think they. I remember them. They played UCLA and gave them a pretty good beating. But other than that, I don't think they really played anybody that is that great. So Gonzaga goes down and Duke advances. So that brings us to our final four, and I feel like this is the this is final four is going to be epic. You got Kentucky, Wisconsin, Michigan State, and Duke in the final four. Four teams remaining. And you know what I? feel like makes this Final Four so special, Chad? Are the coaches. It's the coaches. In college basketball, well, really, in the NBA, players, it's a very players-first type of organization. It's very, it puts a lot of emphasis on the players. LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Russell Westbrook. You hear about players. You don't really hear about coaches. In college, you hear about coaches a lot. They focus on the coaches. And like you said, I feel like coaches just makes this Final Four so special. Look at the coaches we have in here. Coach Mike Krzyzewski, Coach Bo Ryan, Coach Tom Izzo, and Coach John Calipari, four of quite arguably the best coaches in college basketball. Uh, Coach K, uh, he has the most wins of all time, and if he wins this game, he this will be his fifth title, and he that makes him tied with Adolph Rupp, who also has, well, let's see, this Adolph Rupp have four titles, or does he have five? No, Adolph Rupp has four. So if Coach K beats, if Coach K wins the national championship, he will have five titles. So he will beat Adolph Rupp, which means he has the second most national championships behind John Wooden. So let's just hope he doesn't bring him that fifth title. Absolutely. So um, that's what makes uh, Coach K so he quite arguably maybe the best coach today in today's game. So, Bo Ryan. You know what's interesting about Bo Ryan? Is he was a Division Three coach, and he won four national titles. Four national titles in Division Three, And um, as a Division One coach, he's went to back-to-back Final Fours, two of four Final Fours uh, that Wisconsin's ever had. Do you know anything else really about Bo Ryan that makes him so 
I don't know much about him. I just know that he likes to build a program, unlike John Calipari, where he likes he's more towards the one and dones. Uh, Bo Ryan likes keeping his guys for three or four years, like the Comiskeys and the Deckers, and there was a couple of other good guys that he's had in the past that he's like to keep there for three or four years. And um, he he grows um, he grows his program. his team yeah his, yeah his program yeah he he likes to keep them around and he likes to produce veterans and I mean it's working for him back to back Final Fours that's that's hard to do I don't think people understand how hard it is to make to advance in the tournament it's one thing to make it to the tournament but to keep advancing and making it to the Final Four that's special and Bo Ryan's done it twice and that, that's that's huge so and then of course our coach. John Calipari. Coach Cal is about to do something that no one has ever done, and that's go 40-0, and 0, win more games than any other coach in a college basketball season. That's crazy. It's actually pretty unbelievable. Like, just sitting here thinking that we could possibly go 40-0 is just amazing. But, you know, I'm going to take it. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to see any other school do it other than UK, and for us to be in that uh, situations is it's unbelievable. Uh, this it's like a it's like a dream. It's not a reality right now. Like this is this year has been crazy and it's it's been historical. The whole world's just watching Kentucky, and it it kind of brings the question: Is people wanting Kentucky to win so they can achieve that forty and zero status, or are they wanting them to lose? You know, I've heard uh, it's about it's about fifty fifty here. I hear I hear people saying they want Kentucky to go forty and zero. And I also hear the opposite. They want them to lose. Like, there was a guy I listened to today who said that he wanted Notre Dame to be rewarded for how well they played. But, I mean, they, they didn't get rewarded. But as, as great as they played, they didn't get nothing out of it because they lost to a team who is undefeated. But, yeah, it, it's it's kind of going both ways right now. I think – I mean, wouldn't you agree that pe- there's people out there that – it's like 50-50 that people want us to lose and want us to win. Yeah, I definitely agree because it's Kentucky. People, I feel like you either love Kentucky or you hate Kentucky. But in this certain scenario where they're 38-0, they have two games left to be in 40-0, I just feel like that people – it's hard for me, It's hard to convince me that everybody roots for Kentucky because they want to see that 40-0 status because – you know, if you're not a Kentucky fan, you really don't want to see another program achieve that before right. yours does. Yeah. But then again, I think the people who don't really care much about college basketball just watch it for the heck of it. I think they are cheering for Kentucky. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So, uh, you know, something interesting about uh, Coach Cal and Bo Ryan, they're both um, con- being considered to be in the Hall of Fame, which is going to be announced next Monday. So that Final Four game could really determine maybe uh, something there for one of those coaches. Um, you know, because they're going head to head. So, do you think Coach Cal or or Bo Ryan will get into the Hall of Fame? They should, especially if uh, or, well, even if even if we say we do lose and we go thirty nine and one, what Cal has done, he definitely deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, especially taking teams um, that he or not taking it the way he does things with his one and dimes, the win in two thousand and twelve, and then in two thousand and Eight with Memphis, which he got those wins vacated, but I mean, just he's just an unbelievable coach, and I, I definitely agree that he should be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, um, and then what is he? He went so he won the championship in 2012, 2000. Last year he was in the Final Four. Yes. This year he's in the Final Four. Um, 2011 two, Final Four. 2011 was in the Final Four. So I mean, just it's just yeah, he definitely deserves to be in there. Now, Bo Ryan, don't know much about him. You seem to know more than I do about Bo <laughs> Ryan. Um, so I would definitely say Calipari deserves it over Bo Ryan at this point. So we'll just have to see what happens with there. But, you know, coaches definitely is what makes this Final Four so awesome. But definitely the players as well. We don't want to forget our players. We had the four best big men in the league in this tournament, in this Final Four. Jamal Okafor. Frank, Jamal. Uh, Jalil Okafor. Jamil, sorry. I'm Jalil. sorry. J- Jalil. 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 Frank Kaminsky, Carl Towns, and Willie Cauley Stein. Four of the best big men in college basketball is in this Final Four. That's going to be fun to watch. Definitely. This is, I'm looking so, I'm so forward. Oh, hold on. Let me start over with that. I'm looking forward 
to these next few days. These this week's gonna be go by so slow. I'm mean, looking forward to Saturday night. Um, it's it's gonna be awesome though. I, I'm glad that uh, we're gonna have a chance to be able to do this again. And hopefully this is gonna turn out a little better than last year did. Last year was a great run, but I'm looking forward to seeing how this year plays out. The last two games. The uh, Final Four, it's April 4th, and it's on Saturday. And the first game is going to be Michigan State versus Duke. And that game tips off at what time? Is it 6 09, 6 08, some random time? I don't understand that. I don't understand why they. <laughs> I don't know. It might get 6 10, 6 o'clock. But 6 09, like, that's just so random. I don't, I don't know why it's like that. And it's only for tournament games. You don't see any regular season games or. The conference tournament games at six oh nine. I don't understand the times behind that. I I don't either. But it's it, they're they're going to be the first game, and then uh, of course the highlight of that night is going to be the Pursuit of Perfection team, Kentucky, facing off in a rematch from last year, Wisconsin in the Final Four. But I want to switch gears here to some coaching changes that's been going on in college basketball. Tennessee. I haven't been able to talk about this since last week. Donnie Tindall, the coach of. Tennessee, and it was. I actually went to school at Moorhead State. That's where I graduated from. And Coach Tyndall was the coach the entire time I was there. And I actually got to meet Coach Tyndall. He's a very interesting man. And he didn't strike me as the type who would cheat, but that's exactly what he did. And Coach Tyndall, um, I'm not really for sure about the violations. I know that the violations centered around improper financial aid for two players, as well as an academic problems with junior college transfers. According to a copy of Tyndall's termination letter, Tyndall had lied to Tennessee officials about the extent of the violations on several occasion, occasions. The letter also revealed that Tyndall had admitted deleting several emails from his Southern Miss email account, even though he knew that the emails were relevant to the NCAA investigation. So, Athletic director Dave Hart called Tyndall's hiring a mistake and admitted that he would have never hired Tyndall had the full extent of the Southern Miss violations has been known. So he fired Coach Tyndall, and as of March 31st, 2015, his contract expires, and Tyndall will no longer get paid. So there's no buyout for Tyndall because Tennessee learned their lesson with Bruce Pearl. They, it, they took such a shot with the Bruce Pearl they made sure that when they wrote up this new contract for Coach Tyndall that they was not going to have to buy this coach out if this coach had an NCAA violation. So Coach Tyndall is out at Tennessee, and Tennessee has went ahead and put a new man in charge of their basketball program, and that is Rick Barnes. And the reason Rick Barnes is even was even available to take the Tennessee job, it's not like he left Texas for Tennessee. He was actually let go from Texas. Rick Barnes had been with Texas for 17 years, and he hadn't been to the Sweet 16 in eight years. So, you know, I don't blame Texas for, you know, letting Rick Barnes go. He, you know, he had a a record of four, like, 402 and 180 was his record. So he doesn't, he wins games. He knows how to win. He just can't get the school advancing in the tournament and that's what you know goes back to the argument does the regular season matter over the tournament you know yeah I actually like that I like that uh, move for Tennessee to get um Rick Barnes I, I don't I'm not sure how many years he has left though I mean he's like is he he's 60 so you wouldn't think that would be a long-term job for him there I mean, maybe I guess some coaches do uh tend to coach a little bit later into their into their life but um I really, I really like that move for Tennessee. Uh, as bad as I hate Tennessee, it's, it's good to see these SEC teams bring some of these bigger name coaches in, like Rick Barnes and like um, – here, I'm drawing a blank here. The well, guys we just got for uh, – did we just hire another SEC coach that was really good? I can't – I'm yes, blanking right now. Yes, we hired the former UCLA coach. Oh, Ben Howland. Ben yeah, Howland. right. I knew there was something this past week. Yes. And, uh, you know, the SEC is full of excellent coaches. So it's not – if the SEC is bad next year, it's not the coaches. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i sorry. It's, it's not – it's not the – I don't know. The coaches in the SEC, it, I'm, I'm loving how it's going here because we're getting so many personalities in the SEC. John Calipari, Billy Donovan, Rick Barnes, Frank Martin, Bruce Pearl. Maybe um, Greg Marshall. Maybe possibly Greg Marshall, yes. So speaking of Greg Marshall – he is probably the hottest name on the coaching 
uh, trail for all of these schools. And the one school that is going after Greg Marshall is the University of Alabama. Now, you might ask, why does Alabama ha- stand a chance to hire somebody like Greg Marshall, who is an excellent basketball coach and who considerably might be maybe top ten in the game today as a basketball coach? Why would he even be considered in Alabama? Because he is being offered $3 million a year to coach at Alabama. That would make him the top four highest-paid coaches in college basketball. That's a huge salary, Chad. Yeah, especially coming from a school like Wichita State. That's just that's unbelievable what, what he's getting offered there. Um, yeah, from the day, it seems like that he may be the guy that goes to Alabama, I, which is a bigger name than what we thought that – they would bring in since they're such a big football program, but that would, I, they'd, that'd be a great fit, fit for a, uh, or a great grab for Alabama to get Marshall. I used to think that there was just no way that Greg Marshall would go to Alabama, but because of that offer, three million dollars, Alabama is willing to spend money to get a good coach to win, and that's what you got to do if you're a program and you want to win. You have to be willing to drop some dough, and that's what Alabama's offering Greg Marshall. They're offering the money, and I don't think he's going to get a deal like that anywhere else. I know Texas, which is now a vacant uh, position open since Rick Barnes was let go, they're targeting Greg Marshall, but, you know, is Texas going to be able to lay out a, a contract like Alabama laid out to Greg Marshall? I don't know. So, we'll just, it'd be interesting to see what that happens. I feel like that within the next 48, 72 hours, Alabama is going to uh, hire, make a hire. So, I don't know really who's who stands in second under Greg Marshall. Well, actually, I see uh, right now that this was posted 21 hours ago that uh, Alabama's uh, interim coach John Brandon is a final finalist for the head coaching job. I don't know much about him um, other than I guess he was their maybe assistant coach there under who Grant who was the who was his first name Anthony Grant Anthony Grant yeah so it, it looks like that. Uh, It'd be him, and then 10 hours ago, yeah, the the AD was supposed to meet with Greg Marshall on the potential coaching job at Alabama. So, you know, that's, you know it's interesting that assistant coaches, you, you hardly hear of assistant coaches advancing to a, to head coaches uh, if their coaches let go. You know, like if, if I'm your assistant and you get fired, it's rare that I step in as the new man in charge. It's kind of like they get rid of that whole new, that whole error, that whole Chad Rainwater air, they'd get rid of it. Right, but if you want to, if you want to win, what makes you think that bringing in an assistant coach has been under you for so long is going to do better than what you did? Like you yeah. don't, you would think you would go out and get another coach that has been a head coach for several several years, and unless you wanted to rebuild your program, I don't think that there's any reason to bring in an assistant coach over a coach that had been at a bigger school like Wichita State and Greg Marshall. A lot of names that was being rumored for coaching jobs, a lot of hot names, was Archie Miller and uh, Steve Prone. I have Greg Prone written down. I don't know why, but Steve Prone from Murray State. Archie Miller was from Dayton, Steve Prone from Murray State. But both these coaches signed extensions with their respective schools. Archie Miller signed a deal with Dayton, and Greg Prone signed a, I know it was a $500,000 a year extension with uh, Murray State. I think personally it was a mistake. I don't think they should have done it. I think that had they not assigned those extensions, they could have landed a better job than where they're at. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, I don't know what other jobs are open right now though that are that are bigger bigger schools other than Alabama. Texas looks like they're gonna uh, reel in Shaka uh, Smart. Um, yeah, I don't know what other jobs are open right now to for them guys to go. Well, um, I think probably the biggest job that's open that maybe they, they could get besides Alabama or Texas would be Arizona State actually fired Herb Sindek. That's right. He got fired yesterday the day before. Yeah. After nine years of being with him, he only made the tournament twice in nine years. And, you know, a lot of schools, they, they're not asking for a, for a Final Four every year, but they at least want you to make a, an appearance in the big dance. And... Twice in nine years, it's you know, and you're getting paid millions of dollars. It's just not going to cut it. Yeah, I think the only run they made was with uh, James Hart. I'm not sure what year that was. I guess it was maybe oh seven, oh eight, oh nine, somewhere around there. But they made a run, and I think they actually got upset pretty early. And I guess that's the last time they've been to the tournament. 
some uh, names that's been mentioned for that job is Duke assistant Jeff Kappel, Josh Pastor, he was the head coach of Memphis, who was a Calipari guy, uh, Trent Johnson, uh, the TCU coach, Bob Hurley, the Buffalo coach, Russell Turner, UC Irvine, Steve Lavin, the former St. John's coach, and Michael White, the LA, uh, Louisiana Tech coach. Speaking of St. John's coach, they just made a huge hire. And it was, uh, I, I feel like it was huge. It was, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank now. I believe, was it Chris Mullen? I'm looking up right now. Chris see. Mullen, for, uh, they, they just signed a major deal with him. And a lot of people thought Steve Mossiello was going to be stepping into that role. Including uh, Ryan. Including Chris Ryan. Mullen. Chris Mullen. Ryan's probably very upset. He wanted that so bad for Mossiello to go to St. John's. <laughs> I loved it because Ryan would say, Rip Patino, Louisville, perfect. John Calipari, Kentucky, perfect. Billy Donovan, Florida, perfect. St. John, Steve Mazzello, perfect. And it didn't happen for him. So, yeah, I, I'm sure he was – you know, I wanted to get Ryan on the show today. Ron's feeling a little under the weather, so he couldn't join us. So. Probably because Louisville lost. Yeah, Louisville did lose. That's, that's his team. And, and, you know, he has the stomach virus, a.k.a. Louisville lost virus. I don't know what it is. But um, we'll be back after our, the championship game, which is – uh, April the 6th, that Monday, we'll be having a post-championship night podcast. Win or lose, whether it's Kentucky or whether it's not Kentucky, we'll be back. But ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to thank you for listening to the show. I want to give a special thanks to Harrison Sims for calling in and being a guest. Chad, it's always a pleasure to sit down and do the show with you. Yeah, man, I always look forward to being on the show, and I guess I'll see you again hopefully next week. Yes, hopefully next week, man, and we'll uh, break down the Final Four and the championship game, and we'll talk the champions. And we'll see you next time, ladies and gentlemen.